morning boys um so today i want to get us ready for tomorrow's test so we are going to go through this document i'm going to explain some things to you that are going to help you to prepare for tomorrow's test please take notes don't just sit and watch um this and be passive about it sit and take notes okay um it is a way for you to prepare for tomorrow's test um so just something to note first of all tomorrow's test is going to be images okay but these images are going to be very particular ones and the questions and, and the extracts that you're going to read here are going to be very much based on um, on uh, these images. Okay. All right. So, so three ways that you're going to need to prepare for um, tomorrow's test is step one. You're going to reread the notes on Ozzy Mendes by Shelley. Okay. If you did not do me the courtesy of even taking notes of the video that I made for you, the video is still on Google Classroom. You're going to need to find it there on Google Classroom and you're going to need to take notes again and just just be familiar with Ozymandias and, and what the poem is about. And you can do your own extra reading as well online. Okay. The second way that you can prepare for tomorrow's test is you're going to read the, the, the sources that are going to be provided below. Um, this is an 11 page document okay so there are a number of um of extracts that you can read um just to prepare yourself for tomorrow okay there's also questions there you can pause this video and just read through these questions okay i'm also going to provide this document to you all right so i'm not going to read everything for you um so these are just some of the questions to think about while you are reading the extracts just to think and not to just passively read and then step three, um, you'll remember that I shared this with you as well, the five W's of how to um, how to pick out fake news. So you're going to find one more source for yourself that you're going to add to the reading list. And this source you must have vetted. So you must have decided that um, it is legit news and it's not fake news. Okay, just to add on and to have um, to, to enhance what you already know on the subject. So those are the three steps. So the first extract is here. Again, I'm telling you that you're going to um, be given this document. I'm going to put it up on Google Classroom. So um, this will be available to you. I'm just going to scroll past text one because we're not going to read it now in this video. You're going to read it on your own. Okay. Um, text two, you're also going to read on your own. Okay. Preparation for tomorrow. What I'd like to go through today is um, text so as I'm reading this, something that I'd like you to think about and write down so that we can discuss after is um, what is hot nationalism and what is banal nationalism? And also why are like obviously when we put up statue when we put up a statue now, there's an intention with that with that statue. Okay, but when we look at that statue a hundred years from now and we look back, we kind of realize that the reasoning has changed and the meaning of that statue has changed after like a hundred years from now. And so that is why there are so many monuments and so many statues that are being taken down now. Because in the past, when they were put up, um, the, the, the country or the area believed in something different to what they believe in now. And maybe they believe was a lot more exclusive in the past. Um, to what it was now. So I'm going to read this article for you and I want you to listen and I want you to think about, okay, the, this term hot nationalism and banal um, nationalism and also what makes a statues and monuments problematic, okay, according to this article. Given the conflict surrounding the removal of the Confederate uh, monuments in the United States recently, it seems that monuments certainly do continue to matter, particularly when they are removed or destroyed. While it might seem that statues blend into the background after a while to become a part of a familiar streetscape, they can very quickly become lightning rods for political division. So here what I'm reading is that we get so used to certain statues being uh, being somewhere. When you go to Rhodes University, um, Cecil Rhodes um, is put up. When you go anywhere else, Pretoria, Johannesburg, there's all these statues that are, that are up. And we become so used to them and they don't mean, they, they seem not to mean anything. But sometimes if we really take a closer look, we realize that um, a lot of the statues that we see around us, they, they, they represent a belief that we no longer stand for. Okay. Not only do they represent a particular version of history, they also represent the power that history 
that history and the fact that it is given prominence and authority. It would be easy to tell it would be easy to tell someone protesting the removal of a controversial monument not to worry, that history is not being erased, as it, it still is amply represented in books and other archival sources. However, the key issue is not the erasure of history, but rather the fact that prominence, power, and authority is being taken away from, the, from that particular historical narrative. So we give our history a lot of power by putting up monuments and by keeping um, certain monuments up even to this day, is what this article is saying. In Ireland, now I've moved up too high. In Ireland, we have our own long tradition of creating and removing controversial statues, and the Irish experience might have something to offer in understanding the current tensions and conflicts around the meaning of monuments around the world. Many people in Ireland will know about the destruction of Nelson Pillar, Nelson's pillar, pillar on the statue of King William of Orange that used to stand outside the gates of Trinity College Dublin and was regularly vandalized by members of the public and college students until it was finally blown up in 1928. They may have heard about the statue of Queen Victoria designed by John Hughes RHA that stood outside Linus, Lannister House until it was removed and relocated to the grounds of the Royal Hospital at Kilmina, Minaham in 1948. It was moved again, this time to Sydney in Australia in 1986. These monuments were built at great expense, but their meaning significantly changed in the different political circumstances. Their removal, either through violence or political decision, reflects the fact that they were no longer deemed worthy of occupying the public space of the nation. This begs the question, how can monuments and statues have such disparate meanings? How can they function as symbols of colonial oppression for some people, sources of pride and identity for others, and useful romantic meaning meeting places in the busy city centre for many others? We spoke about this in class yesterday, boys, um, how um, different images, different pictures carry different meanings for different people and we spoke about how that is based on our different experiences so for one person something can be offensive but for another person something can be um can be fine in, in fact it can, it can be aesthetically pleasing to someone else but all of these is is based on um, our experiences of it but i think that people in authority need to realize that they're catering for everyone so if it does offend a few, maybe it is um, to be considered to take down um, certain certain things if they if they offend a certain group of people. Okay, the work of Lawborough University social psychologist Michael Billick provides some interesting perspectives on the strange ways public monuments work in our society. His book. Barnell Nationalism, in 19, which was written in 95, identified the differences between hot and Barnell Nationalism. Hot nationalism refers to those moments in life and society where it is very obvious that a national identity is being performed or reinforced. Wearing shamrock to the St. Patrick's Day, yeah, St. Patrick's Day parade, or the signing of the national anthem, singing of the national anthem before an Irish football game abroad are examples of hot nationalism. So I want you to think about um, examples for us as South Africans. What is what are examples of hot nationalism? It could be um, certain images, for example, of um, the Springboks uh, raising up the World Cup last year. Um, or it could be the symbol of Sia Kolisi, because Sia Kolisi isn't just the captain of our rugby team. He is our first black captain. He um, he represents he represents so much more than just rugby and so much more than just our country. He's also like the first. He's our first black captain, and he won us um, the the rugby world cup. So that's a very very significant, very very significant message. A very very important message. Right. And those are so I want you to think about some of our examples of hot nationalism as South Africans. OK. But Billig argues that these performances of hot nationalism 
requires everyday engagement with banal nationalism in order to make sense. So what is banal nationalism? Um, that involves all of our everyday encounters with day-to-day -day objects, such as passports, the flag that we see around us, the images on the stamps we use, the language on the signposts or the harp symbol on envelopes that lets us know that our taxes are due. These are everyday markers of national identity which shape our sense of place and our everyday encounter with the world. So my understanding of this is that our banal uh, our banal nationalism is all the little things that we don't that that don't that don't make our chests swell with pride. So it's not the Springbok sign because that that gets us excited because we want the World Cup and so on. And I'm using the World Cup example because it's the most recent one. But for example, the coat of arms, the African coat of arms, for example, um, the flag, uh, like there's so many little things that 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 make up our 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 banal um nas our banal nationalism, and I want you to think about some of those as well. Things that we see every day that represent South Africa, that make us South African, that we don't even take to heart, and we just see, and they just pass us by, you know. Statues and monuments occupy a strange middle ground between hot and um, banal nationalism. When they are first constructed, they can certainly con they can they can certainly consider they can be they can certainly be considered as hot. Their construction involves fundraising, the selection of an artist or a sculptor, a design process, the hard labor involving involved in constructing the monument, and the political uh pageantry around its uh, official launch. As the monument becomes part of the streetscape transversed, I just moved up too high, transversed by people as they go about their business, these hot meanings fade and they become part of the everyday world, another element of the street. But despite being in our per peripheral vision, Rather than the full focus of our attention, they still structure our experience of our public spaces. Just because we do not walk around continually reminding ourselves of our national identity does not mean that the nation is not continually representing itself to us in our daily lives. So the point that the writer is making here is just because um, we just see, like, like, like statues are somewhere in between. It's okay, so on, on one level, statues um, can represent what we believe in as South Africans. We can be proud of it. We can stand proud and whatever. But other statues could be just an old statue that's just been there for over 200 years. It's just what you see when you go to Fudraka Monument or any other place for that matter. It's just a statue that you see there and it doesn't mean anything. But what the writer is saying there is that just because it's something that we see every day and we're like desensitized to it. It doesn't mean that it doesn't still represent the country. It, 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 so, so if the country, as a country and as a government, we don't take those things down, we are still putting it down as one of our belief systems. It forms part of our belief systems, right? Problems arrive when, arise when the monuments seem to represent a nation or an ideology that is no longer acceptable. Ideology and perception changes, but bronze stands still. They move from being an everyday encounter with an accepted idea back to being hot. But this time, they are hot with tension because they represent the opposite of shared communal identity for some. When this happens, they quickly move back into the limelight. Their destruction represents the fact that their presence, their presence in public space has become intolerable for some. When tensions arise, it is clear that two, if not more, ideas of the nation exist as competing communal identities. Public space becomes extremely contentious in these cases, and different groups compete for control of the monumental space of our cities and streets. The monuments do much more than just signify specific histories. They structure our everyday physical, emotional, and social experience of place and identity in the way that they are woven into our daily lives and routines. Okay. So I like I like what, what the writer says there about ideology and perception changes. So we can we can believe one thing today and believe something else um, tomorrow. But the fact that we believed one thing today and we made a statue that is permanent and then we change our belief tomorrow, but we keep those statues up, 
is very telling. So visually, we're saying that we still sort of believe in the old things. And so that's why we keep those statues up there. And this is the argument where he's sort of suggesting that maybe the statues need to, to be taken down because we, we no longer have that ideology. We no longer believe what those statues represented back then. So it's very important to think about what did these statues represent back then and what do they represent now that our perception has changed and so on? Why do we still keep that, right? So for example, if you think about, if I think about, it's not a statue, but if I'm a Christian, I will have a cross, right, that I, that I, that I carry around my neck. I remember when I was watching some of your um, museum videos, um, one of you actually said that you have a cross that your girlfriend gave you. Now, if the two of you were to break up, chances are maybe maybe not that strong but chances are you would you would return that cross or you would stop wearing that cross or that necklace or that chain because now you believe in something different maybe in the past you believed that you'd be together forever but now your ideology has changed your belief system has changed so would you then still wear that chain and if you do what does that say about your belief system now so these are the things that I'd like you to think about, okay? Um, there's also some stuff to read and, and to watch also in preparation for tomorrow. If you can get through everything, please do so. Um, otherwise, what's really important, I don't know if we'll have time in class, what's really important is to um, watch also what Russell, this Russell Brand um, video as well. It's about 20 minutes long. And then this is also just other preparation sort of preparation videos. I'm not going to ask you any specific, it's not a comprehension. I'm not going to ask you questions about this, but this will help you to give you sort of a like like a like a a foundation and a way of preparing so that you're able to answer those um uh, the pictures that I'm going to give you for tomorrow. Please remember with critical literacy, with visual literacy, whenever you are given a picture and you are asked to answer a question based on a picture, answer, and I said this in class yesterday, answer according to what is on the picture. I see a lot of you defending things and you're defending them as men, maybe if we're dealing with gender issues or you're, de or you're defending them as a white person because, you know, we're dealing with race issues. And that's understandable. We are all prone to defend ourselves immediately, but try and look at what the image represents and take yourself out of it. Take, don't take it so personally and make it about you as a black person or you as a white person or you as a man or you as a as a woman in my case, but look at what the images represent. Okay, um, that's just another way of um, of uh, preparing for tomorrow as well. Okay, I hope this video is is helpful, and I hope that we can talk about it and unpack it during class. Have a good day, boys.